Good morning. My name is Charlie Nolan. Uh, I was the director of the tuberculosis C control program at Seattle in King County uh, in the 1980s and 90s preceding Massa Narita. As we gather uh, today to honor the memory of Dr. David Park, whose splendid UW career combating tuberculosis as an educator, clinician, and researcher was cut short by his untimely death in 2016. The organizers of this lecture wanted to take a moment to honor and acknowledge the passing of Anne Elarth, Anna Marie Delegi Elarth, who made her own extraordinary contributions to TB treatment and control in our community for more than 30 years. For more than 20 of those years, Anne was a nursing supervisor at the Public Health TB Clinic at Harborview. She and I worked together every day, every weekday, for over 20 years. And on every one of those days, my admiration and respect and affection for this remarkable woman grew stronger. Anne died last month at the age of 82. Anne managed a team of nurses and outreach workers who largely spent their days in the streets, alleyways, and shelters of Seattle delivering treatment for tuberculosis to patients and serving as their liaison with the healthcare system. This photo published in the Seattle Times in 1983, it's a little grainy, forgive me, shows, uh, shows Anne herself delivering outreach treatment. During Anne's tenure, the clinic successfully treated more than 1,500 patients with tuberculosis and delivered ad, uh, a preventive treatment to many thousands more. But those uh, impressive career achievements just scratched the surface of Ann Elarth's persona. She was a big-hearted woman. She loved people. She was a matriarch of a large and close family. Two of Ann's children are with us today. Her home in the Ravenna neighborhood was open continually to neighbors and friends. This photo comes close to capturing Ann's essence in her kitchen, joyfully preparing meatballs and spaghetti for family or friends or both. And friends, I've got to tell you, those meatballs were awesome. <laughs> Anne also welcomed literally dozens of students, residents, and fellows, many here today, into our clinic over the years to introduce them to tuberculosis, enabling our teaching program and the rich body of research that emanated from the clinic. Our honoree, Dr. David Park, certainly myself, and even our speaker today, Dr. Lewinson, were three of Ann's boys and proud of it. Rest at peace, my wonderful colleague and friend. Thank you. our Park Memorial Lecture. Here you can see three pictures of him. David Park was a beloved pulmonary critical care physician based at Harborview Medical Center, who died three years ago at the age of 54 after a six-year battle with brain cancer. He was raised on a family farm in Vermont and went to medical school at the University of Vermont, where he fell in love with his future wife, Julie, who's here with us today. Together, they came to Seattle for residency training, Dave in internal medicine and Julie in pediatrics. Dave was chosen to be chief resident at Harborview Medical Center. As you can see, that's his picture up in the upper left-hand corner. He then went on to train in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Washington and went on to become a faculty member in the division. 
Dave and Julie have two children who are now young adults. Hailing as he did from Vermont, uh, Dave spoke the truth in frank language that honored his New England heritage, but was always delivered with a twinkle in his eye, as I think you can appreciate in the middle picture there. He possessed common sense in abundance and brought it to the practice of medicine. He was loved by his patients and he aligned his recommendations with their priorities. Dave was a teacher par excellence and the recipient of many awards and he was a valued uh, mentor, colleague, and friend. Dave had, he had wide-ranging interests, but he had particular interests in medicine in the areas of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, tuberculosis, and medical education. And these are the themes for this annual memorial lecture. Which brings me to our speaker, Dr. David Lewinson, MD, PhD, who is a physician scientist and professor of medicine at Oregon Health Sciences University. Dr. Lewinson completed medical school at Stanford University and an internal medicine residency at the University of California, San Francisco. He then came to University of Washington for fellowship in pulmonary critical care medicine training, where he was a year behind David Park and importantly became a good friend of his. Following fellowship, Dr. Lewinson was an acting instructor at UW before joining faculty at OHSU. He is an internationally recognized leader in TB research. Much of his work has focused on understanding the role of human CD8 positive T cells in recognizing intracellular MTB. I think most impressively, his laboratory is run jointly with his wife, Dr. Deborah Lewinson, who is the division head of pediatric infectious diseases. He's equally respected for his clinical acumen, particularly in TB, and is the lead author on the most recent CDC IDSA ATS. ATS recommendations on the diagnosis of tuberculosis. He is a committed and successful mentor and is a vice chair for research in the Department of Medicine at OHSU. And we are fortunate to have him as our guest for the David Park Memorial Lecture. Well, I wanted to, David, thank you for such a kind introduction. And um, I'll make sure, how do I get my slideshow going? Maybe just to kind of lead off by just saying what a pleasure it is to be here amongst sort of friends and colleagues. And Charlie and to Anne, thank you so much for introducing me to TB. I think those turned out to be really seminal experiences for me and I'm very appreciative. Um, there we go. Great, thank you. So I want to kind of start off um, just to say a couple of words about Dave. Um, so it was really easy to get to know and become friends with Dave. We both love to ski, and um, uh, both are married to really wonderful physician spouses, um, have kids that are a similar age. But one of the things that we really, um, and I think you're all aware of like what an amazing clinician and clinician educator Dave was. I think what be, maybe is less clear is that he was actually in Sean Skerritt's lab at the time that I came, and we ended up spending a lot of time talking about TB, its natural history, and sort of how either diagnostics or vaccines might actually allow us to eradicate TB. And in fact, most of the things we thought were really fascinating at the time have not changed. And I think if you're a young scientist out there, I'm going to say that all the things I thought were so interesting are still really interesting, and it's led to a very... Um, kind of fascinating career for me. I also want to kind of call out the Northrop Park Fellowships. These are the Furland Fellowships. I think I was the second Furland Fellow, and um, they have a long history of supporting the Pulmonary Fellows at the University of Washington, and I don't know if anybody's here from the Furland Foundation, but I do want to call that out and say thank you very much. Um, so let me start. So if you look at the chest x-ray, I think we all know the sort of protean manifestations of tuberculosis. And I think if I remember very fondly, Otto Trott who used to come to our chess conference and would say, the trachea is deviated to the right. And he would say, this must be TB. So we, we would, I think most of us would get that x-ray. I think what we kind of forget is that TB is not an acute illness, it's a chronic illness. And in fact, I think it was termed consumption. It kind of drove much of the romantic era in terms of sort of the romance of being skinny and sick for a long time. 
And I think in terms of thinking about the natural history of TB, this is going to be really critical to understanding how it works. I also want to point out that TB and humans have lived together for a long time. So pretty much if we look at any either pre-Columbian, Peruvian uh, mummies or Egyptian mummies, there's always evidence for TB. And so I think it highlights the idea that perhaps both TB and the human host have co-evolved over some time. And I'll point out that mycobacterium tuberculosis isn't, is really requires a mammalian host, and MTB itself is almost certainly the human host that's key. So I'm going to start off with sort of what, and, and I think you guys are going to tease me because I was always known as the guy who showed the, the pictures of the old guys. Um, but I want to point out sort of both something, things that are quite exciting, but also things that are a little bit sobering. So the guy up on, the on my the top left there is actually Robert Koch. He discovered mycobacterium tuberculosis and in fact Koch's postulates really sort of went through the exercises of linking the bacterium to the disease. And you can see this is actually the guy with the paper airplane is actually um, Dr. Waxman who is credited with discovering streptomycin which was the first effective anti-TB drug. And what's a little bit sobering is that sort of following some experiences with the MRC and sort of learning how to deliver effective TB therapy, we had basically curative TB regimens that went back to the sort of late 50s, early 60s. And so it's currently 2019, and I'm going to give you some sobering data, but we've been able to cure TB really for some time. And in fact, what's mainly improved over all that time is not, not really the efficacy, but the duration of the therapy. And then finally, I show at the bottom left there, this was the sequencing of MTB in 1998 by Stuart Cole's group. And that's really led to really a kind of wonderful revolution in TB diagnostics. So things like Gene Expert, our ability to rapidly diagnose drug resistance, and then most recently, some real progress in vaccines. So that's really led to, I think, an explosion in our ability to do both diagnose TB, to treat it, and possibly prevent it. And I think you can see this is data actually from the CDC in the United States, and I think you can appreciate sort of the really dramatic decreases in TB case rates over time to the point where what we're seeing in the U.S. is that TB now is really a largely a disease of the foreign-born. And this data is actually really nicely reflected in Moss's report, um, and you can see that both the case rates in both... Do I have a pointer here by any chance? Um, you can see that the case rates... Or maybe I can do this... Um, you can see the case rates both in Washington and the United States are really quite low. I think that's about six per 100,000. And from a TB controller, I think we consider case rates of about less than 10 per 100,000. You're in the zone of TB eradication. That is, you've really switched from sort of trying to decrease transmission to really trying to eradicate TB. So that's really a phenomenal accomplishment. So then if I show this slide, this is really kind of depressing. So this is TB around the world. Um, so these are case rates, and I think you can appreciate that in sub-Saharan Africa we have case rates that are over 300 per 100,000. So that is really a raging epidemic of TB. And even though the case rates are somewhat lower in India and China, just the sheer volume of TB in those places sort of highlights the reservoir of TB. And TB also has the kind of dubious distinction now of having become the most, um, the most uh, common cause of infectious disease mortality in the world. So I show that up on um, the panel to your left. And you can appreciate that as HIV deaths have declined, TB deaths have been, remained relatively stable and accounting for about one and a half million deaths per year. So really the, the progress that we've seen in the United States and Europe has not really translated to the rest of the world. So really what we get to is how can we possibly actually eliminate TB? And this is just one part of a really nice study that was done by Edward Dodd here in Seattle. And this panel, what it really illustrates is that to really eradicate TB, this is not going to take place by simply improving TB treatment. And again, this gets back, I think, to the sort of chronicity of TB and these prolonged periods of transmission that occur while you're sick. And what this graph shows is that basically to eradicate TB, and in this case, eradication would be considered getting down to about 10 cases per 100,000, what you have to have is mass latent TB therapy. I could also show you a very similar graph for TB vaccines. And so it's clear that either of those two interventions, either mass treatment for latent TB or TB vaccines, uh, are really necessary for TB eradication. So I show this slide. This is from the WHO. And they, um, along with the Stop TB Partnership, put together a global plan to NTB or um, the NTB strategy. And this was done in about 2015. And so the goal was to bend the curve. The goal was to actually target TB 
eradication by the year 2035. So that's those curves drawn there. The first part of the curve really looks at just taking what we know how to do, which is case finding and TB treatment, and to do it better. And then the second half of that curve is really asking, okay, if we were to have an effective vaccine, if we had an effective therapy for latent TB, we would really require those interventions to really bend the curve. This is a little bit depressing because the little dots on the top is what's happening right now. So we have not really bent this curve at all. In fact, the, the kind of decrease in, in case rates is only about 1.5% per year, which means that at that rate, it'll take us somewhere between 1 and 200 years to eradicate TB. So we really have to do better. And I think the challenge for us is really understanding how we can do better and sort of I'm going to kind of make a pitch for advocacy at the end of my talk. So this really highlights the idea that really to bend that curve to really eradicate TB, we're going to have to have improved diagnostics. And as I pointed out, the modeling really, in, I think, mostly includes either shorter drug regimens, better identification and treatment of those at risk to get TB, and then vaccines. So I'm going to really now get into the natural history of TB and really kind of challenge, I think, our current understanding of that. Unfortunately, I had a, um, a picture of Anne Elarth, which I, I did not successfully get in here, but what Charlie used to say about Anne was that the sputum induction was putting Anne and a patient together in a well-ventilated room. And I think that, that, um, that our concept of sort of TB was sort of bimodal, I think, at the time that I started my training. That is, there was either active TB or there was latent TB. And I'm going to talk about how that, that notion is almost certainly not correct and how maybe it's kind of slowing us down in terms of TB eradication. So this sort of complicated slide I'm going to break down a little bit sort of, and try to break it into like what we know and what we really don't know. So what we do know is that TB is transmitted via aerosol and uh, through mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we know that patients who have smear positive cavitary TB are really quite infectious. So that part's pretty sure. And then you inhale the mycobacterium and from there on out, things get very uncertain. So the first part is, could it be that you inhale the bacteria and we somehow eradicate it? And there's some reasons to think that could be true. Only about 50% of people who live in a household contact actually convert their skin test or their, their interferon gamma assay, which would be our way of knowing they're infected. And this is actually something that I think Tom Hahn and Shaitan Shashadri have been interested in, is sort of what would confer resistance to infection in the first place. We then think that the mycobacterium somehow gets into cells, and whether those cells are epithelial cells in the airway or things like macrophages or myeloid cells, we're really not entirely certain. But we do know that once you develop evidence of an adaptive immune response, which is either a positive uh, skin test or a positive interferon gamma release assay, that would be our indicator that there's been exposure and possibly infection. Now, we really have no measure like a viral load or something like that that would tell us whether you're really infected or not. So this is sort of beyond this. We sort of speculate that maybe people who have a positive skin test are infected. And beyond that, in humans, then, the outcomes are very uncertain. Um, I would argue that most people who have a positive IGRA or a positive skin test actually have pretty much normal lungs, and which makes us think either the TB's gone or we really don't know where it's living. Um, we can certainly see things like granulomas or tuberculomas, and, um, and then eventually we get some proportion of patients who go on to actually get TB. Now, I would say that we know a lot about what makes us vulnerable. So, for example, if you don't have certain cytokines like interferon gamma or TNF, or if you don't have T cells like CD4 T cells, you're certainly at high risk. But we still don't really know what confers protection. And so this remains one of the really great unanswered questions in terms of if we really want to make everybody look like they're resistant, how do we actually go about doing that? So what accounts for the persistence of TB? And this is something that I think Dave and I love to talk about. So it could be things like, that we, we still estimate that about a quarter of the world is actually infected, and of course that's a surrogate measure. Um, as I mentioned, there are prolonged periods of transmission that are associated with TB being a chronic disease, and that of course means that by the time we find a case, it's probably already infected multiple other people, HIV. And so these questions, where does TB really live in the human host? Um, is infection ever really eradicated? And who's at risk for going on to get TB once infected remain, I think, these really interesting questions. But I'm going to go back to some really old data that I think is really informative. So these are two different graphs from some studies that were done in the late 50s, early 60s. And um, one of which was a BCG trial that was done in the United Kingdom, and the other was preventative INH trial. These are the control groups. So this is just the natural history of TB. 
And what you see is that in the first couple of years, and these are household contacts, um, and so these are people at high risk, and what you see is the first couple of years after being exposed, you're actually really at quite high risk to go on to get TB. And then there's a tail. And so this has sort of led to this idea that we all say, which is that, you know, the, your lifetime risk of getting TB is, you know, 5 or 10%, and then your risk of getting TB following an acute exposure in a household contact is roughly 2 to 5%. But when you look at that curve, you'd say, what, what is latent about that curve? You sort of have the first part, which would be sort of something acute going on. This is acute TB infection, and these are people where something is happening and they're at high risk, and this is almost certainly what drives the TB epidemic. And then you have this long tail. Now, I want to point out that the time these studies were done is at a time where we there was a lot of TB, and so we probably didn't fully appreciate the contribution of sort of reinfection, re-exposure. So that tail, some of that is reactivation, and some of that is probably re-exposure. And this really highlights the difference between an area of the world where we're looking at um, really TB control versus TB eradication. So it's almost certainly true that that first half of the, of the curve is what's driving this epidemic, but the second half definitely happens. In the U.S., we have many, many people who are, who are foreign-born, who have lived here for more than five years, so they probably haven't been recently exposed, who can nonetheless reactivate. And we certainly see this in the context of immunocompromise. So for TB eradication, I think the second half of that curve is really important. But for TB control, it's probably the first half. So let me um, kind of break this down. So I think what's evolved over time, and I don't think this would have been new, to George Comstock and the people who did those early studies is that TB is really more a spectrum than that kind of bimodal TB or latent TB concept. So the first part of that would be infection, you get exposed and maybe we eliminate this without ever having the opportunity to prime T cells. So this is the kind of work that Chetan and Tom Hahn are doing in their, in their cohort in uh, Uganda. And so the idea would be like if we could really understand what really controlled TB in that early exposure, that might be really interesting. The next two categories, you, you, you develop adaptive immune responses, and then you either have eliminated the TB or you haven't, but, but it's in a quiescent sort of phase. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any way to measure the difference between those two outcomes, but I'm going to argue for this talk that those are probably not the drivers of the TB epidemic, that those are pro somebody with quiescent infection, maybe they could reactivate at some point, but they're probably not the issue. So I've drawn that red line there to sort of highlight the two categories that I think really matter. So the, the first one is actually people who have bacterial, active bacterial replication um, that's maintained by the immune response. And so some people would call that smoldering TB, subclinical TB. Um, and I'm going to kind of highlight that we are probably getting closer to being able to identify those patients. And then, of course, you have clinical disease. And so if you remember one thing from my talk, it's the idea that, that subclinical TB and TB are really the same thing. And maybe if we can identify that box right there, that might actually really help us eradicate TB. So from a, from a kind of functional standpoint, this study is really fantastic. It actually um, comes out of South Africa. And what they did is they took subjects who were um, HIV positive, but by all definitions would have had latent TB. That is, they were, they were well, they had a normal x-ray, they would have been presumably good candidates for INH chemo prophylaxis. And what they did is PET CT scanning of those subjects, and they could identify subjects who you would define functionally as having subclinical TB. So I'll show you this picture here. So this is just a number of those subjects. And as I mentioned, they clinically have latent TB. And what you can appreciate is the sort of the PET avid, um, in this case, lymph node in panel A that goes away after six months of isomizid, um, same just below. So these are, these, are, these are healthy subjects who appear to have kind of active inflammation that resolves with TB therapy. And the other thing they found um, is that those subjects who had the positive PET-CT were more likely to go on to get TB than, than the control group. Now, this is a very small study. I think it doesn't really definitively show that those patients with a positive PET-CT are going to go on to get sick, but I think it's very provocative. So kind of getting to this spectrum then, the question really then, given that we don't know how to measure uh, bacterial burden in the context of people who are who are latently infected. The question is, could we use host surrogates to sort of get at those questions? So I'm going to give you some examples of how that could be true. 
So this, kind of going back to the interferon gamma release assays, and so as you all know, we can, we can diagnose latent TB either by using a tuberculin skin test or by using interferon gamma release assays. And those assays actually rely on an immune response to two antigens, ESAT6 and CFP10, that are present in TB but not BCG and not most environmental mycobacteria. And, you know, we'll get to this later, but there are certainly lots of arguments about which test is better, which is more accurate. Um, but what's really interesting is that, first of all, in the right context, that is, patients who would appear to be exposed to TB but, but well, that is, sort of clinically don't have TB, the negative test, whether it's either a quantif or an, an IGRA test or a skin test, has excellent negative predictive value. So you can actually be fairly confident that they're not going to go on to get TB. The positive predictive value, however, is, is not as good. So on, on, on the um, left side, there's, this is a meta-analysis by Madhu Pai, who looked at 20 studies, and he looked at um, uh, 20 longitudinal studies of patients who were IGRA positive, and he found that the incidence of TB ranged anywhere from 3.7 to 84 per, per thousand uh, per person years of follow-up. So not fantastic positive predictive value. And the other study that I show here was actually what's called TBNET. So this is a consortium of 10 European sites. And they looked at about 5,000 contacts. Um, and they, of those 5,000 contacts, they identified 24 incident cases. Interestingly, only 50% of those who were IGRA positive elected to be treated. So this formed kind of a natural experiment. And what they found was that treatment based on the interfering of Morelli assay was about 80% effective. So that's very similar to what we knew already for treating based on a skin test. And, and what, he, what they found was that, the, that while the negative predictive value was outstanding, the positive predictive value was quite low, roughly 2%, which means that you had to treat about 40 cases, 40 people to prevent one case. Now, the, what, you, what you kind of hear from that is, oh, these tests have lousy positive predictive value. And I think it's hard to know fully what that means because if we were talking about cancer screening and we were, could do 40 tests and prevent a case, I think we'd be happy with that. So I think it's a little more subtle. I think it really gets at the balance between the sort of accuracy or the diagnostic predictive value of the test and the treatment we have at hand. So for example, I have this graph here. So on the far left, you would have the current status, which is we have to identify 20 or 30, 20, or 20 to 40 people to prevent one case. And our current therapy is about, at best, 12 months. I'm sorry, sorry, three months, 12 weeks, and has, I would say, sort of moderate toxicity. And so you're sort of balancing treating that number of people with a kind of a long and maybe somewhat toxic therapy. Now, you could imagine either A, we do a lot better job of identifying people at risk. So, for example, if I, could, if I did a test and, and one in two of those people was at risk, you'd be, probably be a lot more enthusiastic about that three-month therapy. Or conversely, if I had a ZPAC, and I knew that I was going to safely treat people for a week, you'd probably be very enthusiastic about that. So I think we have to sort of try to balance the positive predictive value of the test and the sort of cost and toxicity of the therapy. Okay, so getting back then, so the first thing obviously to think about is the quantiferon itself. So this is a blood ELISA, again looking at responses to the two antigens, ESAT and 6 and CFP10. And so these are two studies that actually are sort of telling us that there's actually more information in, that, in those tests than we sort of give them credit for. So the first one is actually a vaccine study that was done in South Africa looking at infants who got a, a mod MVA or modified vaccinia vaccine. And so sadly, there was really no efficacy to that vaccine, but they nonetheless were able to sort of look at the rel basically the relationship of the um, quantiferon test with developing disease. So this was done by Jason Andrews at, at Stanford along with his colleagues at Safi, and it's kind of an amazing study. So what you can appreciate is that if you look at those kids who had an actual quantitative value of over four, they had 10 cases um, out of the 63 that actually had that. So that was actually has a relative risk of 42 compared to the reference, which is people with a negative quantifieron. So it turned out that that very high value was really quite predictive of going on to get TB. And the other study that was published last year comes out of Norway, and they looked at about 45,000 folks from a registry, and they used the registry to actually evaluate the risk of TB prospectively. And again, what you see is that if you look at the actual quantity of interferon gamma that's released, 
and you look at the likelihood of going on to get TB, there's a linear relationship. So for example, the very high positives had a relative risk of about 30, and the actual low positives had a relative risk of 8. And so it goes from 8 to 19 to 31. So I find this data really kind of stunning in the sense that what it says is that you should pay attention to those values when you get an IGRA back, and that those very high values are clearly correlated with a likelihood of going on to get sick. So this study um, really begins to get at the real identification of subclinical TB. So this is the sort of landmark study that was done by Anne O'Gara and her group. And what they did is they, did, they developed a gene signature. So this was doing basically RNA profiling of either patients with TB or latent TB. And they could clearly develop a gene signature that distinguished the two groups. And so that's sort of kind of graphically up there. Uh, what you can see is that that correlated with the degree of radiographic abnormality. So the, the more advanced disease had a, a stronger weighted average of those gene scores. And then also it resolved post-treatment. And what was kind of intriguing about this study was these little clusters of patients who appeared to be latent TB but had nonetheless had the active TB signature. And that was sort of followed by the study by Dan Zak and his colleagues at Safi. Um, this is really an amazing study. So what they did is they prospectively followed about 6,000 adolescents in Cape Town, South Africa. And as a result, they were actually able to do, develop RNA signatures that would actually predict in advance who was going to go on to get TB and who wasn't. So let me show you that. So these are the ROC curves for that. And so what you're looking at is the sensitivity and specificity of the signature. So this was a 16 gene signature. And so what you can see is that between 0 and 180 days is the top curve. 181 to 360 is the orange one. And so what you can see is that you're actually predicting who's going to get TB as much as two years in advance of them actually getting TB. So this signature is much like the Anogara signature, and what, what characterizes those signatures was a little bit unexpected in the sense that it's a signature of interferon alpha, which we kind of think of as being a neutrophil signature, a signature of viral infection. So it wasn't maybe what you would have thought in advance as something about T cells. Um, but nonetheless, it sort of argues that we do have patients who seem to be at high risk to go on to get TB. Now, I think the sensitivity here was, um, was about, about 66%, so it's, it's far from perfect. And the specificity was, was, in this cohort, pretty good. But there's some barriers to this kind of test. So the first is we really have no precedent for doing RNA signatures as a kind of a diagnostic clinically. Um, there's kind of a cool paper that kind of got this down to four genes, and there's certainly a number of companies that are interested in translating this, but, but right now I don't think we have a good example of an RNA-based diagnostic test. And the other is specificity, and I think this is probably the greater concern. So obviously I showed you that this test is really quite good at distinguishing active from latent TB. However, um, this is the summary of the studies that have now looked at the same gene signatures in a number of different contexts. And I think what you can appreciate is, for example, influenza has the same exact gene signature as TB uh, and bacterial pneumonia to a lesser extent. So this gene signature is not really specific for TB, but none, it's nonetheless in, an indicator that you might have subclinical TB. So this kind of gets then to sort of cellular indicators of TB. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. So the first is CD8 T cells, which, as they mentioned, is my favorite thing. Um, I just want to highlight how T cells work. So I think you all know that T cells sense intracellular peptides or, or proteins. And T cells have to sort of sense that by virtue of class 1 or class 2 molecules. So basically the antigen presenting cell can sample its interior. For class 2, these are going to be soluble antigens. And for class 1, these are really truly intracellular antigens. And so if the T cell can see those things, it can become activated. I show my picture of Steve Reed, who was my um, mentor, who was at IDRI at the time, and really, I think, was, uh, helped me get started with this project. So CD8 T cells in general, a couple of reasons I think they're interesting to think about. The first is they can recognize class II negative cells, and what that means is that cells that are not macrophages, not uh, dendritic cells, things like epithelial cells, are not going to be able to turn on CD4 T cells. We've also shown that they preferentially recognize heavily infected cells, and I'm going to show you that I think they can serve as a surrogate potentially for sensing intracellular burden. So this is a study actually from Virginie Rosat, uh, done from um, Switzerland. And she looked at CD8 responses to the same two antigens, ESAT6 and CFP10, that are in the uh, IGRAs. 
And she did flow optometry, and what she showed in this study was that she found CD8 T cells more likely in pulmonary than extrapulmonary TB, and she found them to be in higher frequency in smear positive than negative TB, so that's shown here. So again, if we think that people with smear positive TB have a higher bacterial burden than smear negative, this would be a suggestion that this might, might be useful. This is actually a study from our lab done in conjunction with our collaborators in Kampala, Uganda. And again, looking at CD4 and CD8 responses to the same two antigens. And in this case, we took advantage of a longitudinal study that was done by the, TBR, the TBRU in Kampala. And so what you can see, these are patients then followed over time. So looking either at the time of diagnosis, two months or um, six months later. And what you can see is the CD8 response steadily decreases with time with treatment, whereas the CD4 response doesn't change. So again, suggesting the treatment might result in diminished bacterial burden and therefore diminished CD8 T cell responses. So this, is, this, this and other data has led to the, the, the kind of the, the development of an improved or new quantifieron test that takes advantage of the CD8 response. So this test actually adds an extra tube so this tube takes the same two antigens, ESAT6 and CFP10, but formulates them as short peptides, which are better at stimulating CD8 T cells. And, um, and so this, this TB2 tube is meant to be a surrogate uh, for CD8s. So this is a meta-analysis that I think just came out, and you probably can't read it, but the very top study is from our own David Horn. And um, what it shows is that the sensitivity of the TB1 tube, and keep in mind that we don't have a surrogate for latent TB, so this is using TB as a, as a surrogate readout, um, was really pretty good, about 90% or so with the TB1 tube, and it went up to close to 95% with the addition of the tube. So at least showing some added value to adding those short peptides. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about activated CD4 cells. So this is a really nice paper actually from Jyothi Rengaran's lab at Emory. And what they did is to compare latent TB and active TB, taking advantage of an assay that actually takes cells and stimulates them with TB antigens, and then looks at markers for CD4 activation. So that was either HLA-DR or proliferation, which is KI67. And you can see that she was very clearly able to discern the active TB patients from the latent TB patients by just looking at markers of cellular activation. And then mate cells, so this is also one of my favorites. Let me talk about those. So one of the things that, that I was interested in actually coming back to my fellow work here was this question of how does the immune system really recognize that TB infected cell? And of course, thinking the surrogates there are either improved diagnostics or improved vaccines. And we did something very simple, which was just to begin just doing like highly, basically, Clone, like doing a lot of T cell cloning, so looking at cells that respond to a TB infected cell, and then basically asking how do they work. And one of the things that was really surprising right early on was that many of those cells are non-traditionally HLA restricted. So what does that mean? So traditional HLA restriction is what we think of as traditional class one and class two. These are highly diverse genes recognizing a highly diverse set of peptides, and it's what we all have to think about when we do transplantation. So and it makes sense because you're going to need diverse receptors to recognize diverse peptides. What was surprising was that the, many of the cells we found were non-traditionally restricted. And what does that mean? So these have been called donor unrestricted T cells. And they um, basically take advantage of receptors that are highly conserved across individuals. So for example, you know, your MR1 receptor and mine are going to be the same exact gene. So there's no diversity. And that's because they often present things that are sort of found uniquely in a microbe. And interestingly, this is sort of the family of these donor unrestricted T cells. They all have examples in TB. So the CD1 molecules, for example, present lipids um, that are really not found in humans. So th these are things like mycolic acid. Um, we found HLA-E, which recognizes glycopeptides. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about mate cells, which recognize vitamin metabolites. So, so these cells, um, which are, turn out to be quite prevalent, are use a molecule called MR1. And it's, on, it's not in the MHC family of molecules. It's, like I said, very highly conserved. And interestingly, sort of is essential for eliciting a response in a family of T cells that are called mate cells, or mucosal associated invariant T cells. And they're called that just because they use a relative limited repertoire of TCRs. And what makes them sort of unusual is they don't recognize peptides or lipids, but they actually recognize metabolites. So if you sort of think of T cells sensing things like the peptidome 
or the lipidome, these are essentially the metabolome. And so it makes sense that if you have a, a microbe that's making a vitamin, for example, that's not found, it can be sensed this way. And what we found is that if we compare patients with active TB to latent TB to those that are not infected, these mate cells are pretty much gone in the blood of patients with TB. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about NKT cells, which is in that same family. So this is a really great study. It's actually done by Jane Sutherland and her group in the Gambia. And they actually looked at about 2,000 household contacts. And they followed them prospectively for more than two years. And so they could kind of work their way backwards from the time of diagnosis to sort of what did their T cells look like before they got diagnosed. And what you can see is that this family of T cells that are called INK T cells, which is in the same family of weird T cells because they're restricted by a molecule called CD1D, they're, again, were very, very low in the patients who went on to get TB, at least as, certainly as far as three months out, maybe as far as 18 months out. So what does this mean? So I think these are um, really, really exciting data in the sense that what I think it says to us is that measuring the host, whether it's a gene signature or a cellular response, can clearly distinguish latent TB from TB, and I think that's really important. Obviously, the specificity is going to reside, I think, in, in, first of all, in the measurement of TB-specific antigens, as we've shown for the IGRAs. But I think it also raises a lot of really interesting kind of questions about how we would use these tests um, diagnostically. So, for example, if, if you have a strategy that might say if you have a negative IGRA test, you're unlikely to progress, would we add, a, add one of these tests to sort of help us hone in on the sensitivity for progression? If that were true, would you have to do this more than once? So if you're living in South Africa and you're getting continuously exposed, you know, the one test is, may not be sufficient. And, um, and it depends a lot, I think, on the, the setting. So if the prevalence of TB is very, very low, as it now is in the U.S. or in Europe, you know, one of these sort of correlates studies may not be useful. And then finally, you know, does this really work? That is, if we treated patients based on these signatures, are we really going to prevent TB? There's a really interesting study going on right now that's called TORDIS that's taking place in South Africa where they're actually enrolling patients who would be considered to not have TB and treating them uh, based on their correlative risk work. That, as far as I know, that data is not yet out. I do know, though, that they're detecting a lot of TB. So everybody who gets enrolled in that study has to then get a sputum. So these, there's quite a number of patients who appear asymptomatic who nonetheless have a positive sputum for TB, sort of arguing that they're actually discerning kind of subclinical TB. And whether or not this gene signature is what's helping with that is not yet known because the study is still blinded. So I'm going to just spend a minute or two talking uh, a little bit more broadly. So I think what I've shown you is, is kind of depressing, right? That we've had curative TB therapy for more than 50 years. And we nonetheless have this raging epidemic. And the question is why? And what can we do better about this? So I want to kind of return to these studies from, from Bethel, Alaska, because I think the more I've looked at this, the more I think they're really kind of interesting. So on, on, on the left is actually the, the, not the control group, but the actual group that got INH. And what you can see is that giving INH kind of worked. So they got about an 80% reduction in TB case rates, and it looked as if somewhere between six and nine months was the best. What I think is really stunning, though, is so this was all done in one area of, of Alaska. It's the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. So it's about 400 miles. And these are very small communities. And so these were actually prevalent surveys that were done. And keep in mind, these are, you know, that this is done by tuberculin skin testing, which is a surrogate. However, it's kind of stunning data. So if you look at when the studies started, which is sort of the late 50s, early 60s, and Charlie will remember better than me exactly when, what you can appreciate, which is really crazy, is that if I was five years old, a roughly at least 50% of those five-year-olds had a positive skin test. Um, and you can see by the time they're like adolescents, it's most of them. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And that, that argues that there's this tremendous kind of force of infection that was taking place in those communities at the time. And then what you see in the last survey, which was done between 1969 and 1970, now if I'm five years old, the prevalence of a positive skin test is less than 10%. So you, I don't think you can say this is one thing, because obviously they were doing INH chemoprophylaxis. They were also doing case finding. But if you go back to that modeling that I showed earlier, this is that model. This is, this is active case finding and it's treatment of latent TB. And it pretty much wiped out 
TB in those communities. And you'd have to say, why is that not an example for the rest of the world? I mean, it's kind of stunning data. So why is that? Well, let me, let me just mention, this is a slide from Annie Vernon, who's at the CDC. And this is now this, um, now it's popularly called the cascade of care, but I think Andy was talking about this before we knew it was that. And the, for those of you who work on TB, we've had endless arguments about whether the skin test is better, whether IGRIS are better, and it gets down to it's these very small numbers. But this data would sort of argue that we're missing the point, right? So if, these are household contacts, so these are patients that we know would benefit from INH. And what you can see is that, that roughly a half to two thirds actually complete their skin test that is had it read. And then of those, you know, maybe a quarter of them were found to be newly infected, so they would definitely benefit from therapy. Roughly two thirds of those actually start therapy, only half of them actually finish. And that means that only, let's say at best, 40% of our target population actually took their INH. And this isn't a group that we know for sure this works. And I think this gets to sort of a matter of how we think about this disease and what we say to patients. Um, so here's my take home messages. So my first message is that subclinical TB is TB. And my, my uh, thesis would be that if we can find those patients with subclinical TB, that's gonna really make a difference in terms of kind of helping with our epidemic. And so that's that sort of third box. And the second is that finding and treating those at risk for developing TB is possible. And not only is it possible, but it has the potential to actually make a real dent in the epidemic. So I'm gonna kind of um, end with a couple of more, kind of more provocative slides. So this is Eleanor Roosevelt, which is in my theme of showing old people. And um, she actually died of drug-resistant TB. And interestingly, was the architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which is basically, she argued that you basically need to have everybody have access to the benefits of scientific progress. So that this is a human right. This isn't really just something we should do, it's something we, we have to do. And which means that funding TB research is a human rights imperative. And I'm gonna kind of talk about this just for a moment. And I wanna end with this in part because one of the things that really impressed me about Dave is that, that he was an advocate. I think in all the work he did, whether it was for patients, whether it was for his colleagues, he, he was a passionate advocate. And this is my example of what advocacy can do. So this is AIDS in the 1980s and 90s, and I think for those of us right now, we're kind of living through this miracle of kind of highly active antiretroviral therapy. I mean, it's incredible. And we've gone from, you know, really bleak counseling patients to whether they should or shouldn't be on a ventilator because they had PCV pneumonia to people living really full and productive lives. Now, how did that happen? I think it happened through really effective advocacy. So I showed this group called ACT UP, which, um, which was busy throwing blood on people and making a lot of trouble. But they became very scientifically kind of literate. They managed to advocate for funding for drug development and, and HIV vaccines. And so as a result of that, you know, the funding for HIV is something like 10x that for TB, which is something we, we shouldn't diminish HIV, we need to increase TB. But they were very effective, and I think the efficacy was both having kind of research, science literate advocates, and it was having scientists who were also advocates. And so I really look at Dave and I'm like, wow, he really did that, that's, that's his legacy to me. And so, um, just to conclude with that, just to thank the people in my, my lab. So I want to call out Debbie. Um, we've, we've run our labs together for a very long time and almost all the work that I show we've done collaboratively. I also want to call out Lynn Swarbrick who's been our lab manager now for... <laughs> Questions for Dr. Linson? <clears throat> That was really great, and I'm sorry what happened at the end. Um, uh, just an implementation question. Um, the blood signature uh, test that, that you spoke about, um, where is it at in terms of the volume of blood that needs to be collected? Um, can it be done with a finger prick, or are we not there yet? Um, so I, I, you know, I don't know the answer. So, I think, I think a couple of mils is currently feasible. I don't know about the finger prick, but you would think. There's lots of neutrals in the blood, and so I'm thinking that might be quite feasible. That would make a big difference in terms of the input being able to... Oh, absolutely. And I didn't talk into, I mean, there are other um, 
I think there are other, I, there are quite a few documents I didn't cover. I think things that are urine based are also pretty interesting and there's been real improvements in detecting TB stuff in urine, things like lamb. And that obviously, that is a surrogate for the microbe itself. Hard to collect print from everybody in this right. Yeah. Yeah, David, that was great talk. Thank you. Uh, you you presented a, a a rich collection of research that's been going forward in the last several years. Is the funding still available to enable that kind of research that we're going to need to move toward elimination? The short answer is no. Uh, I, you, it, it, it's um, the, the, the group, Mike Frick's group, and I think I showed his slide from the Eleanor Roosevelt. There was a, the first ever high-level meeting at the UN last year for TB that, that laid out sort of some targets for funding. So, for example, the research funding target is, is $2 billion for year, and we fall well short of that year on year. And that's like one-eighth or something of what HIV gets. So there's clearly not enough funding. And I think what even confounds that is that, for example, I didn't talk about vaccines, but it's been a really good year for vaccines in terms of some, showing some, some real efficacy. And if you look at, for example, the cost of taking, these were phase 2B studies that just came out, it looks quite promising. So the cost to, let's say, take that to market is probably in the billions as well, and there's no real obvious funding for that. So the answer is no. Um, and I think a big part of this equation is sort of stepping up um, it's sort of stepping up not just the money amounts, but the capacity in parts of the world that are really affected. And those are largely BRICS countries, right? So that's India, China, Russia, and South Africa, largely, that I think have the money and also can develop the people. Because, you know, I think it's really important to have the researchers that are doing this work in the parts of the world where this is taking place. So those are huge gaps. And I would, my short answer is no. Jeff. Hi, Dave. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, you talked a lot about host factors. I'm wondering, um, can you say a few words about organism factors? Are there variations in virulence that would also maybe allow you to identify and target oh. strains that are more predisposed uh, to progress in, in regions where those occur? Yeah. I think this is working. Yeah. I mean, Jeff, that's a fantastic question that I don't think I have a very good answer to. There's clearly strains, like the, there's this thing called the Beijing strain, which is really prevalent in China and a lot of Southeast Asia, that really seems to be um, more virulent than, than other strains. Um, it kind of gets to this sort of like, how is it that TB has persisted for so long and like what happens? So there's, this, this is more wild speculation on my part. So if you look at TB, let's say in Europe in the late 18, the 1800s, it was a really different beast. Um, there was... I think it was much more likely you were going to go on to get TB. Um, and the same thing happened in Alaska, you know, when TB was sort of entered into the Alaskan community, which occurred sort of, I don't know, early 1900s, et cetera. And yet we know it's an ancient disease, right? So is, is the question like introducing a strain to a population that they're kind of not, they're not co-adapted at that point? Is that what drives virulence? I mean, that's sort of my theory. And, um, and so what happens then, you know, we come in 100 years later and we see this thing that looks like TB versus latent TB. That's probably not how it looked when it first got introduced. So I kind of think there's, there's clearly a lot to be understood about the strains, but I also think that sort of this host strain interface is likely really key. But it's a great question and I don't have a very good answer. Yeah, yeah you mentioned briefly of neutrophils and the type 1 interference signature. Is there more information about that? Is there a known role of neutrophils in this disease? Is there neutosis or other yeah, activation yeah, no, of it, neutrophils that might be interesting? Okay, and, and you have to remember my, my, my PhD thesis is all about neutrophils. So I, I've been finding this really super interesting. There's hardly anything known. Um, right, you would, you would, cause the people who were truly like neutrophil deficient develop other bacterial infections young in life, and I don't think TB emerges as, as a problem. Um, and it really hasn't been studied that well. And, I'm, and one thing that I, I would love to talk about a little bit are the models that we have really don't replicate what happens in people well. Um, so for example, 
our, our mouse model, maybe with the exception of some of the work that Kevin Erdahl has been doing with like ultra low dose challenge. You know, what do we do? We give, we give a mouse aerosol TB, which we say is a low dose, but they all get TB. And then we sort of modulate that, you know, either a knockout mouse, some of them get really sick. As far as I know, neutrophil deficient mice um, don't really do badly. Um, but what we're looking at is sort of like across the spectrum of human disease, it's not what we see. Like, for example, if you gave a vaccine in an infant and you reduced bacterial burden by a half log or something, that would not be a very satisfactory vaccine, <laughs> right? It's like they still have TB, those kids. And what we really don't model is those early steps, right? So, for example, what happens when I'm exposed? And can I really figure out well, who's going to go on to get sick and who's not? And it may well be that those sort of innate mechanisms are really critical in a way that we don't model very well. In fact, that would be my thought. There's some really interesting work going on. You know, one, if you look at malaria, malaria has really benefited from a human challenge model, you know, with those, those so-called volunteers. And um, I, there's been a lot of work to try to get to a human challenge model in TB, which I suspect would really help us develop correlates. There are some really good natural transmission models, like in cows, so some really interesting stuff in ferrets, et cetera, that also might get at these early steps that are really key to really being protective. So I would say the short answer is I don't know at this point about what the role of neutrophils is, but I suspect it's, I suspect it's early on. I think we might have time for one more question, if anyone has. Kind of a general question. I'm wondering, you didn't speak much about drug resistance and how that might be impacting these curves as well as really low rates of treatment success of yeah. the treatment we do have in, in many parts of the world. So those are great questions. So I don't think drug resistance right now is a driver of the epidemic, but it's incredibly important. I just didn't touch on it. So if, it, if at a minimum, it becomes way more expensive and the outcomes become much worse. So it's, it's a huge issue, so I don't want to discount it. It's, they're probably not drivers of the epidemic. Um, and there has been some really encouraging work. So, for example, there's a, a drug therapy called Nix, which I think is a combination of three drugs that was just FDA approved. And in, in extremely drug-resistant TB, it had about 80% efficacy, which is really fantastic. So there the issues are going to be more of like identification of those patients early on because drug resistance testing isn't available everywhere. The drugs are going to be expensive, or they are expensive. So there's sort of these access issues that are really universal to TB, and that's a long conversation because if you go back to how depressing our curves, how it looks in the world, a lot of this is access. You know, that is, um, if for latent TB, there's been this sort of argument that, like, why bother with latent TB because we're too busy with TB, which is partly true, but there's sort of a lack of will there, right? I mean, we have defined groups, recent, you know, young children, HIV, um, household contacts, all of whom we know for sure would benefit from, from latent TB therapy, and it probably blunts the transmission. So, so, and I think it's a huge, I don't know if you've been following this debate, but the GSK really released results that are quite promising for their vaccine called uh, M72. And, um, you know, there's a big debate, A, about how to fund the kind of downstream phase three trials that need to be done, and then about access to that, you know, because, again, Advocacy in TB is really challenging. You know, these are, these are, it's a disease of poverty. Um, I think if you talk to people who've had TB, they don't really want to ever talk about it again. So finding a group of advocates is challenging. And so these are huge kind of advocacy and sort of will issues that I think we have to tackle. Great. A anyone with further questions maybe can come up to the, the front to ask. And one more round of applause for Dr. Lewis. Thank you.